Good morning, Pastor Mark Driscoll here with Prepare the Way Ministries. Uh, we're starting a little early, those of you that are coming on live. We're starting about 15 minutes early uh, just because I have other things I've got to do. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is the last um, message of the sum before we get into the summer season because I'm doing camp all summer and won't be able to do this. We'll start back in the fall. So we're actually not even finished with First Peter yet. We won't finish the last chapter until sometime in August, Lord willing. But we're glad to be here with you now. I'm glad to be in your, in your presence and in the presence of God together. Isn't it great news that we can come together and be with him uh, as one? Even if we can't be in the same room together, we're in the same kingdom together. And we're able to, to listen to the Lord and draw close to him. Pray with me and let's get into the word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you are closer to us than we can even imagine. No matter what's going on around us, Lord, we know that you are Lord over us and we can trust in you. Now, Lord, I pray that you would guide us this morning as we look into your word and allow us to hear your voice and hear you, Lord, as you speak your word to us help us to grow closer. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are times when things happening around you don't make any sense at all. Um, when you feel like, you know, things ought to be going this way, but they're going this way. Um, you're serving God. You're doing the best you can. You're praying. You're spending time with Him. You're loving people. You're doing the best that you can do, and it seems like uh, things ought to be better than they are. And sometimes you look around and you think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, I thought that if I trusted God, all my problems would disappear. Or I thought I would at least, I mean, most of us know better than that. Um, most of us uh, don't believe the fantasy that faith means you never have any problems. There's a few people that believe that, but most of us really don't. Most of us don't really expect a perfect life. But sometimes, even when we're aware that, you know, stuff happens in life, sometimes we look at what's going on around us and we think, this doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, you know, I, I would expect God to act this way and he's not doing what I thought he would do and I'm confused. And sometimes we, we get uh, distracted, don't we, by what's happening around us. And that's very, very easy and sometimes we can get confused and begin to wonder, you know, God, where are you in this time? Let me read to you a word that Peter wrote to those first century Christians in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. And maybe this will give us some perspective. How do we, how do we face life when it's not making any sense at all? Verse 12 begins, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And, quote, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter starts off, let's just go verse by verse and look at what he's saying about those times. Number one, in verse, 15, verse 12, it says, Beloved. Can I just start with that word, beloved? Now, we I don't want to make... Uh, more, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but just the fact that he starts off with that word, beloved. You know, the first thing to, that helps me in times of confusion is remembering that, that God's attitude toward me is love. The circumstances may not 
reflect that at the moment. I may not be feeling love when I when I can't pay the bills or when I'm being slandered unjustly or when I've been betrayed or I'm turn on the news and I and I see that the the chaos around me and I think what in the world and or when I have failed and I know that I've I've done something or not done as I should have done. How can I be beloved? You know, the fact is, is that you're a child of the grace of God and it's through faith in Jesus that you have received the grace of God and he doesn't, his love for you is, is bigger than your circumstances. And no matter what you're going through, begin with the assurance that God really does love you and he sees you as his beloved. You may be in your worst moment. You may be in a bad place. You may have thought, you know, I'm not doing what I should do. I'm not saying what I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I know I should do better than what I'm doing right now. You know what? That may be true. And then there may be some changes that need to be made. But in the midst of that, you can know this, you're loved. You are so loved by your creator. Let's begin there. Let's begin there. And now let's go on and finish the sentence. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now, the first thing is to look at don't be surprised. Peter says, look, don't be surprised when stuff happens. We're in a world that is lost. We're in a world that is broken. A world that, that has turned its back on God. Uh, the Bible tells us of Jesus in Isaiah 53, he was rejected by men. Um, people are, have rejected him. Many today are uh, who have, uh, have deconstructed their faith. They've said, I just don't believe anymore. And then others are saying, I never, I just don't know if I can believe. And, and then we have the mood in our culture, which is a very anti-God move. You know, but it's funny, at the same time, people are looking for hope at the same time. You know, the, the elitist society that we live in that's, that's presently uh, kind of running things it tries to convince us we don't need God, and yet everything else they've taken away from us that we used to have hope in, there's nothing left. I mean, what else are you going to hope in? Are you really going to hope in the government? Are you really going to hope in either the Democratic or the, the you know, Republican or the Independent or whatever party is partying it up in the White House? You can't, you can't trust that. Are you really going to trust uh, your money here today and gone tomorrow? Are you really going to trust uh, you, the things in this society? Are you going to trust the, the, the popularity of the culture, which is so fickle and fleeting? Uh, they're your friends one minute and not the other. Are you really going to, what is there to trust but God? And so that's the way the world is. And so here's the thing, Christian, you're doing the opposite. You're trusting God. Now, because of that, you're flying in the face of everything the culture believes. If you're truly Christian, I mean, I don't mean one of these fakey fake pew riders um, who are thinking if they park their butt in a, in a church every Sunday, they're going to heaven. I'm talking about the person who's following Jesus, taking up their cross daily, following him, trusting in him, listening to his word. That's the Christian. Then that person is going to catch some flag. That person is going to be opposed. Peter says, don't be surprised. I mean, how can you be surprised when you got the devil hating on you, the world hating on you, your own flesh is waging war against your soul, and, and you've got all these enemies, you've got all this stuff. Don't be surprised. It's going to be a fiery trial. And it says, when it comes upon you to test you. Now, not test as in see if you can pass, but to test to show the strength of your faith and to increase the strength of your faith. God will allow those tests to come. He will allow the enemy to come after us, but he'll, he'll put a limit on him. He'll allow the culture to oppose us, but he'll, he'll put a limit on that. And he will, he'll walk you through, and you will overcome. But it's gonna, and it's going to strengthen your faith. But it's going to be painful sometimes. Don't be surprised. You know why we're surprised? When, when things don't happen, you know, you don't get what you think you should have and, and things don't turn out the way you expect. It, it, sometimes I think we're surprised because we have, over the years, we've listened to those false prophet lying, uh, uh, false prophets who've told us that everything's going to come up roses 
just say you believe in Jesus. And then God's going to make you rich. He's going to make you healthy. And he's going to make everything rosy for you. And you're going to be perfect. And he's all this kind of stuff. And, and it always just seems to be, oh, everything's going to be great. And no problems if you follow Jesus. You know, and, and a lot of people have, have bought into that. And our culture is so addicted to comfort and convenience. Uh, we'd rather take a pill to cope with our problems then just change the way we eat and the way we live because that takes a little more work. We'd rather just do the quick thing because we're so addicted to convenience and comfort. And, uh, you know, we've turned our altars into stages for preachers and worship people to perform for us while we watch. And so we've turned our faith into a show. We've turned it into the, the shortcut to luxury. We've turned it into the pathway of convenience. And we've totally forgotten that Jesus said, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And yet we've got these, uh, these celebrity preachers telling us, oh, no, just claim it. And you'll have a new car on Thursday. And all this kind of stuff. And we've bought into that. And so we have this expectation that if I'm a Christian, I should not suffer. I should never have problems. Um, and so while there is great blessing in following Jesus, and his life really is the best life, there's an inherent suffering that happens because you're going against the death march of this world. You're going against it. The world is not improving itself. The world is going deeper into darkness. And you're walking in the light. And you're calling people to turn around and walk with you. And so this is, this is what we're... And you're going against the flow. Don't be surprised when stuff happens. But in verse 13, it kind of says, Not only don't be surprised, it says, But rejoice. What? You're thinking, how can I rejoice when things are happening around me? In so far, let me give you a couple of reasons. All right, number one, you share Christ's sufferings. Do you realize that when you're going through suffering for the sake of your faith, that you literally are sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ? What an honor. I know it's a painful honor, and I know it doesn't always feel like an honor, but you're standing with Jesus, and he's standing with you. And when the world comes after you, they come after him. And they all have to answer to him. And so here's the thing. Rejoice. Jesus said that in, in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, look, when people insult you and make fun of you and lie about you, rejoice and be glad. For also they did the same thing to the prophets who were before you. In other words, you're in great company. Listen, I would rather catch the the criticism and the flack that this world throws, then stand before God and face his judgment. I rejoice because I'm, I'm facing, the only trouble I'm facing is temporary. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be defeated. Um, I, I don't have to face the wrath of God because of my sin, because I, I've come to Christ and he's given me freedom through the cross. I'm delivered from judgment. And that we'll get more into that in a minute. It says, and now there's another thing though. It says, when his glory is revealed, if you are insulted, verse 14, for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now here's the thing as I was reading this that I really felt like the Lord was, was, was showing me. There is, it says, the spirit of glory. That's, you know, the glory is doxa, the, the weight of the presence of God. That's what that glory means, the outshining of the glory and presence and power of God. There is a place of power and glory and strength that comes through suffering. There is a place where God stands closer to us and where his power is poured out more upon us in our suffering, in our difficulty. That's why it says in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. Uh, deep darkness shall cover the earth, 
but his glory will be seen upon you. Friends, we are entering into days of deep darkness. It's coming. It's here. But see, when people trust in God in that darkness, something powerful and supernatural happens. The spirit of glory rests on you. It says in Isaiah 60, the glory of God will be seen on you. You become a glow in the dark. You become a light in the darkness. There is something powerful that happens. You know, you've seen people who are dear saints of God, who've gone through great suffering. There's just a glow about them in there. Isn't there just a strength that you see exuding from them, from people who've really been through it? There have been people who've been through tremendous suffering, but they've gone through with God, and there's this glory on them. And there's this light of God's glory that shines on them. It's not the glitter of this age. Listen, um, I would rather have the glory of God than the glitter of this world. The glitter of this world is worn by those celebrity saints who never seem to suffer. Everything seems to be going great all the time. And they just got the glitter. Oh, look how much money I've got. Look how comfortable I am. Look how good I am. All this kind of stuff. And they're on stage and they're just all this fake glitter of temporary happiness. But I'll tell you who's really, who really I want to know is that person who's been through the fire. And because they've gone through the fire, God has stood close to them and his glory has been poured on them. Friend, you may be going through it right now. You're going through something, but if you'll go through in faith, if you'll go through in obedience and commitment to the Lord, His glory will be seen on you. His glory will give you strength and power. There is a place of intimacy with God that's only known by those who've endured great suffering. There are people who I look up to, who I've just seen, they've gone through pain and hurt and grief and sorrow, but they did it in faith, and they kept their eyes on Jesus. They kept their focus on Him. They didn't focus on their pain. They focused on the healer. They didn't focus on their lack. They focused on the provider. And as they did, the glory of God shone on them. I would rather, again, I'd rather walk in the glory of God than in the glitter of this age. What are you walking in today? Too many of us are walking in the glitter. We just want the temporary happiness. And they don't want any suffering. They don't want any difficulty. Lord, just give me the money. Give me the nice clothes. Give me the nice stuff. Give me the popularity. Make everybody like me. Make it convenient. Make it nice. Don't give me the glory. Give me the glitter. I want the glory. And I want the glory. And that comes through walking with Jesus through every circumstance. And when you're going through it, focusing on Him. And that, so you can, re, that's what it's saying. When you are insulted for the name of Christ, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. There is a, there's something right now. If you're going through persecution in the name of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, there is a glory that's on you. And people can see it. You may not see it, but others can. And you just need to keep your eyes focused on Him and allow His glory uh, to shine on you and to be poured out on you. And then in verse 15, though, it gives us a warning. It says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. In other words, look, sometimes when we go through suffering, we're tempted to react in evil. You know, if you get angry at your government, you may be tempted to do violence uh, because you're frustrated and angry. If you get hurt by someone, you're tempted to lash out and get them back and make them pay for what they've done. If you're running low on material possessions, you may be tempted to commit a crime in order to get, get the things that you need. In our times of difficulty, it's easy to fall in the other direction. It's easy to cave in to the darkness. And that's what he's saying. Don't suffer as a, as a criminal. Don't suffer as a dishonest person. Don't suffer as a gossip. In other words, don't cave in to the temptation to do the wrong thing, even if you think it's for the right reason. You cannot justify uh, evil by saying, well, I'm doing it for a good purpose. That, God doesn't work that way. He does not hire the devil uh, to do his work. 
He wants God. To, he wants His people to do His work. Listen, He doesn't make a partnership with the devil, and you don't either. But so I know you may be in a t tough spot right now, and you may feel like doing something wrong. You may feel like you know what I need to take a shortcut here because I've got to fix something. Sometimes when we're desperate. You may be desperate this morning or this evening. and You may be feeling desperate and feeling like I've got to do something. What you've got to do is get your eyes on Jesus. What you've got to do is stand firm in your faith. What you've got to do is spend time in Him and His presence and allowing Him to show you the steps to take. What you've got to do is live by faith and not by sight. Now, I, I believe as we look around us in my country, and other countries, and we see the things happening, that as we see darkness getting darker, we're, we, we can see the light get brighter if we'll, if we'll do it, if we'll focus on Him. If we'll stop thinking that politics is the answer. If we'll stop thinking that money is the answer. If we stop thinking that violence is the answer. The answer is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a commitment to walking His way. No matter how dark it gets, no matter what happens around us, we are going to live as children of light because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. His kingdom is at hand and ultimately his kingdom will rule. And so he's saying, look, don't fall into the temptation to take a dark way out of this dark time you're in. Verse 16, yet if anybody suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Listen, give glory to God in the middle of your pain. You know, the purest, and I've heard it said more than once, the purest worship is not when everything's going great. The purest worship is when you worship in the midst of your pain. When you miss, worship God in the midst of your loss. When you worship God in the midst of dark situations and circumstances. Giving God glory. for Not because you want to suffer. Not because you're, you're this person who just wants to get hurt. No. But because you know that no matter what happens, God is in control. And He's overall. And He's going to give you the victory. The victory will come. He will do that for you. And you've got to trust in that. And so don't cave in, but glorify God. If you're in pain right now, can I tell you, one of the best things you can begin to do is to worship God. One of the biggest mistakes people make is when they're going through suffering, they'll stop going to church. Maybe you've done that. Oh, you know, I just got so much going on, I just can't get to church. You know, it's friend, that's when you need to go more. If you're in the middle of it, Listen, you clear off everything else for Sunday and you go get in the worship place. You go to that prayer meeting on Wednesday night. You go to that worship service. Don't you dare let the devil talk you out of worship because you're having a hard time. That, that's like saying, uh, don't take that medicine because you're sick. Uh, you don't have time for to go to the doctor because you're sick. Well, that's ridiculous. You need to get to worship if you're suffering. You need to get to worship if you're if you're in pain. You need to get to worship if you're having a hard time. That's the place to go. That's the place to get in the presence of God with other believers and worship God. Worship Him because He's Lord over everything and He's got you in His hands. He's intimately acquainted with all your ways. He knows your words before you speak them. He knows your thoughts before you have them. He knows your ways and he loves you and he's placed his hand upon you. But you've got to trust him in this dark time. That's why it says deep darkness shall cover the earth. But the, the glory of God will be seen upon you. Get in his presence and worship him in the middle of your difficulty. Now, in verse 17, he takes a turn. And he, Peter begins to point the, the gospel at the world. And he says, For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. You know, I believe we're in a time of judgment on the household of God. Now, I believe that God's about to, to change that. And some great things are about to happen. But right now, we're being shaken. And God is revealing darkness that we've allowed in the church. He's, a, he's revealing uh, compromise. He's revealing materialism. He's revealing greed. He's revealing, he's exposing immorality in Christian leaders. 
of <clears throat> terrible things of abuse and immorality and godlessness, idolatry that have been in the church and among leaders. And God is exposing that. And when you see lots of things being exposed, don't despair. In fact, you should rejoice because that means the light's coming. That means God's about to make something great. And he's saying, look, judgment begins at the house of God. If we're calling for judgment, and some Christians, they spend their life praying for judgment. Friend, if you're going to do that, you need to understand that it's going to start at your house. It ain't starting in the street. It's starting in the sanctuary. The judgment of God will start in the places where we claim to be worshiping him when we're really only worshiping ourselves. Where we claim to be loving God when we're really only loving our traditions and our money and our position and our power. He's going to judge that sanctuary that turned into a concert hall. Instead, it ought to be a place of worship. Now it's a place of performance where we just try to wow the crowd with our great personality. Listen, Jesus is calling us to turn that stage back into an altar. And you've heard that before. That's not new. That's been going on. I think the last few years we've been seeing that happen. We're going to see it a little bit more. And so, now, I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I'm just, all you have to do is pay attention. You don't have to be a prophet. Pay attention. Look what's happening. And so here's the thing. It's beginning at the house of God. Now, remember what judgment is for. <clears throat> the purpose of judgment is not just to beat people up who've been bad. The purpose of judgment is deliverance from evil. You see, God is delivering us from evil. When God disciplines me, He's delivering my soul from evil. He's showing an evil that I need to, that I've been putting up with. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to discipline that because it's time to get rid of that. Why? Because he loves me and he wants me free. If, there, if judgment is coming to your church, it ain't because he hates you. It's because he loves you. And he's driving out the demons out of this, you know, with Jesus, I remember Mark chapter 1, Jesus walks into a synagogue and the first thing that happens is a demon starts manifesting and Jesus casts that demon out. He's walking, you know, if demons are getting exposed in your church, Jesus has been, has entered the place. That's good news. Keep praying, keep believing, keep seeking and keep in repentance. We need repentance, church. We need to repent of our sins. We need to repent of our materialism, of our laziness, of our pride, of our division. We need to repent of tolerating immorality in the church. And there's nothing more shameful than hearing a story of, of a child who grew up being abused in church and everybody knew it and nobody said a thing about it. That is dark evil and God's exposing that kind of thing and driving it out of his house. He's driving it out. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I believe that God is calling this church to task. He's calling us to, well, you're either going to be the real thing or not. He's, what he said to the church in Ephesus, if you don't repent, I'm going to take your candle right out of the lampstand. The churches and movements are going to get shut down because they're not doing the work of God. Now, like I said, you don't have to be a prophet to know that. Read your Bible, pay attention. That's all you got to do. So here's the thing. The great news is, is that God is working in those small, faithful people that have been working behind the scenes, not looking to promote themselves, but looking to promote him. And he is pushing them to the front because he's doing a new thing. He's doing a great thing. All you got to do is pay attention. You see it happening all around you. Here's the thing. But then it moves out and he says, if it begins with us, what will be the outcome? of those who do not obey the gospel of God. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will happen to the ungodly and the sinner? Oh, friend, this is such a warning. This is such a warning. If the church is being judged for her deliverance, how much more danger is there for those who continue to reject the gospel? Especially in this country, from where I'm, I'm preaching, where we've had the gospel given so freely and clearly and abundantly, and people are so committed to not believing. I think that judgment is going to be horrible. Can I just, let me say it. For every person who has made an effort to push God out of our country, 
you're going to stand before God, and you're going to stand before the God that you hated. You're going to stand before the God that you rejected. And the first thing you're going to realize is how deeply he loved you. It's going to break your heart because you're going to realize that you have thrown away the love of God. He had so much for you. And he wanted, the Bible says, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And those who, who fail to repent, those who absolutely refuse, are going to face the judgment of God. The righteous judgment, it's, it's, it's deserved. They will know it's right for God to judge the immorality, the self-righteousness, the greed, the pride, the fear, the lust, all the things uh, that that are just sinful. Gossip, slander, drunkenness, um, deception, uh, dishonesty, dishonoring parents. Oh, what a culture of dishonoring parents. And, and parents who neglect children and how they're going to have to stand before God too. Jesus said if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, how much... I, it's better for you to be thrown into the sea than to face God. Because, you know, if you've caused one of these little ones to stumble, and so many people neglect children and abuse children, and how horrific that judgment will be. And yet, but then those who say, well, I'm a polite person, I'm nice, I kind of, I don't do anything bad, but you still have shut God out. Though your creator, your redeemer, and in your pride, you said you don't need him. In your pride, you've chosen basically self-worship uh, that's just as evil as anything else and so what's going to happen and the, the bible says the books are going to be opened the books of everybody's life and we'll all stand before god and those who are not redeemed those who do not who have refused to be saved who've refused to believe are going to have to stand before god and give an account of the lawlessness that they bragged about the immorality that they uh, demanded the right to perform, the, the drunkenness and the, the godless violence that they reveled in, and we'll have to stand before God and give an account for that, and we'll be sent away into everlasting torment. That's a horrible thing. I'm not excited about that. That's not, oh, goody, we're going to get the sin. No. You know, if it weren't for the mercy of the Lord Jesus, I would be in that crowd. The only reason I'm not in that crowd is because of Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. It's through his cross that this sinner got forgiveness and freedom. And it's through that cross that you can have the same. No matter what you've done or where you've been or how far you've gone, you can come to him by faith because he still loves you. He's still calling you to turn to him. Turn from the way of, of running into the headlong into darkness. Turn to the truth of God. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, whoever comes to me, I will not turn away. I will certainly never cast out. He's calling you. His love for you is real. His love for you is sure. Don't reject it any longer. And that's why it says at the end in verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will for that redemptive purpose, that purpose of bringing glory and showing Christ to the world, entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let me, let me just challenge you. Put trust him. Trust your soul to him. If you've never given your life to Christ, it's a matter of saying, Lord, my soul is in your hands, and now I'll turn to you, and I trust in you because of the cross. If you are a Christian, let me encourage you to to keep doing the right thing. Keep focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep staying in His Word. Staying in prayer. Staying in worship and obedience. Continue to love people, even those who are your enemies. Love your neighbor. Do what God has called you to do. Keep trusting in Jesus. Entrust your soul to Him. Because it's through faith in Him that we have our hope. You know, our hope is not in our politics. It's not in our social structures. It's not in the advances of technology. Artificial intelligence um, is an artificial hope. It's not going to save you. And the only thing that's going to save you is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He is coming again. And He wants you to be with Him when He does. Will you trust in Him today? Will you just turn to Him and just pray something like this? Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for me on the cross. I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. And I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, to set me free and help me to live the life I was meant to live. And, uh, and trusting in him. Then connect with the church. Open your Bible. Begin to read the good news. Read what God has for you and all the promises he has for you. And, and get in touch with some other believers and begin to, to pray and worship with them and learn and grow in your faith. It'll change your life. The Lord's calling you today. He's calling you not to a life of convenience and ease. It's a life that will bring difficulty because you're going you're gonna to go against the things of this world. But the outcome will be worth it. Will you trust in him? And that's what Peter is basically saying. You're going to go through some tough stuff. If you go through in faith, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be more than worth it. So trust Him. Stay faithful. Believe in Him. God bless you. Go in peace. And we'll see you in the fall.